I'm the author of Try to Remember, uh, this novel I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about. And um, I, I live in Milton, but um, I have colleagues who are working in this area and live around here, and that's how come I got connected and learned a little bit about Southbridge and had a chance to be in this lovely library. So it's nice to see all of you here today. I'm glad you're supporting your library. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, afterwards, I am happy to sell the books and sign them for you or for, you know, members of the family or whoever if you'd like me to uh, dedicate one to someone else. And they're $10. Okay? So, um, all right. So I wanted to talk, um, and we can have a little bit more give and take uh, dialogue, but I wanted to talk about the, the reasons that I wrote the book. And... Um, uh, some of the things that I've learned by um, having conversations like this with other people that I think are interesting things to discuss. Um, so first let me just tell you, so the book is called Try to Remember. The reason it's called Try to Remember is that in the book there is a young girl, Gabby, Gabriela, Gabriela, who um, is um, growing up and she's trying to remember her father before her father started to lose his mind. Because uh, once her father starts losing his mind, she can't really understand him and she is uh, having a hard time, as is her family, coping with his deteriorating <coughs> mental illness. Uh, so when she remembers the father that she has as a little girl, then it's easier for her to keep loving him even when he behaves badly because of his illness. So, uh, so that's the reason for the title. But overall, the story is about this young girl arriving in Miami, Florida in the late 1960s uh, with her family and trying to make a home for themselves in Miami between um, very different cultures and uh, societies uh, because Miami at the time was changing um, and uh, a lot of Latinos were moving into the area, many of them Cuban. And so she's, and she's Colombian, so she and her family are trying to find their place in this very changing world of Miami. Um, so uh, uh, that's kind of the, the begin what happens at the beginning, but um, the, the big picture story here is what happens when uh, her father uh, makes it more and more difficult for her to, um, to have the life of a normal young woman um, because um, of his illness. And the family are all legal immigrants, that is, they've all uh, been allowed to live here with their green cards, but the father's um, illness gets him into trouble with the law. And even a legal immigrant can lose their legal status if they commit certain crimes, and sometimes relatively minor crimes can result in losing your green card and being deported. So Gabby's life is shaped by this problem that her father might lose his green card if he gets into trouble with the law. And so she has to spend a lot of her time uh, not just growing up, going to school, preparing for college, doing the normal um, things that you do as a young person with dreams and aspirations, but she's spending a lot of her time managing her father at home uh, even when he becomes delusional. So he asks her to do all kinds of very strange things that she does in order to keep him calm and, and peaceful. And so things march along that way for a long time in the book until uh, further on in the novel the, the situation becomes much more than she or her family can handle. It spirals out of control. <coughs> There's a crisis, and then I can't tell you <laughs> what happens because you have to read the book and find out. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's um, uh, you know a, a moment of change. So uh, what I wanted to talk about were the two things that I um, 
feel led me to write the book. And the first was a very personal wish to try to explain the story of how uh, someone like me, I'm Latina, I'm Colombian, I came to this country as a little girl, but as you can see, I speak English perfectly, I hope. <laughs> Sometimes I get my idioms mixed up, but, um, but generally, you know, um, you, would, you wouldn't detect that um, I, you know, I was not successful in, in the English language. So, um, but I had to struggle with some of these issues as I was growing up. So I was very interested in telling one part of that growing up experience in particular, and that is, you know, what does it mean to love your family in a different culture? And, um, and perhaps in other cultures as well, because as I've been going around um, having these talks, I meet people who grew up in all kinds of circumstances, and I find similarities in their experiences, even if they've come from uh, different backgrounds than my own. But um, one of the things that I was brought up with as um, in a traditional Latin family was the idea of being loyal to your family, come what may. And um, many families have that ethic, but um, it was very pronounced in my family. So in the book, I was very interested in trying to explore that question of how far do you have to go in being loyal to your family uh, before you can almost lose yourself and how to balance the desire to uh, become your own person against the needs of your family and your your loyalty to them and so because <clears throat> Gabby's father uh, becomes increasingly a challenge let's say to her um, she he he tests her ability to uh, to remain honorable to her family. And so her challenge throughout the book is that, that question of how can I be honorable to my family and still not lose myself. And, and that's, to me, that's always been a lifelong interest is exploring that question. Not only in my family as I was growing up, but now with my own children, you know, trying to figure out what's the right balance between um, the needs and desires of the family and the needs and desires of the individual. And, and it's always been a question that has fascinated me. And um, I hope, I hope uh, when you read the book, you feel that I've done it justice. And um, you know, I, I would welcome your uh, questions and comments about that um, when, when we're opening it up for discussion. So that was sort of the personal um, drive that got me to write that, the book. And then there is the um, uh, global or um, uh, big picture uh, interest that I have in immigration. As you probably uh, read, if you saw the article in the Southbridge paper, I'm also an attorney. And my work is with immigrants. And my job as an immigrant attorney, immigration attorney, is to um, advocate for uh, more just laws that deal with immigrants. And we have so many of them, uh, not only immigration laws, but at the local <coughs> level, um, there are many laws that affect what immigrants are allowed to do or not do um, in a variety of areas. So this issue um, of the rights of immigrants became even more um, interesting to me to try to write about it in a story after the uh, 1996 changes in immigration law. In 1996, um, Congress changed the immigration laws to make it much easier for the government to deport legal immigrants from the United States, even if they had committed relatively minor offenses like joyriding and um, uh, offenses that had happened way back 20-something years ago, you know, the, the laws became extremely harsh towards legal immigrants. And I don't know if you've read, but in the last 10, uh, 12 years, since, since the 96 reforms, there were all kinds of famous cases like, um, you know, there was a joyriding case, there was a case where uh, uh, 
someone who had been in the United States as a legal immigrant for over, you know, 20 something years was facing deportation because um, when he was a kid, he had been convicted of statutory rape against his wife because they were both teenagers and had sex. And then they got married. They lived for 20 years. They had all these kids. And now the man is being deported because of, you know, the fact that he had this conviction, even though um, it, it, it didn't um, materialize into a serious problem in terms of his life. He married this sweetheart, and then they went and had kids and, you know, uh, did all the good things they're supposed to do, um, working and taking care of his family. So, you know, so these, these very, very harsh laws may be motivated to try to explain the experience of, um, of a girl like Gabby trying to make sense of the world of laws when um, they don't make sense all the time. And so there's, for example, there's a scene in there because her father is facing losing his green card. You know, everything that happens, every rule she encounters causes her to question, geez, how does this rule apply to immigrants? So at one point, it's sort of a joke, but she says, you know, like, could I get deported for not returning my library books on time? Mm. You know, like, how far do the deportation laws go? And uh, so that was a question I was interested in illuminating for other people because I have found that uh, sometimes immigrants, legal immigrants, they don't even know that the laws are so harsh. And certainly regular people who just you know, are uh, going about their business don't realize how harsh these laws are. Now, Congress has done some things to try to rectify the extremes, but, you know, we still have a long way to go to create some balance and proportion in our laws. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, but that was one of the other um, subject areas that I was interested in writing about. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to open it up for, for questions and comments, but um, the other thing I just wanted to share was that um, the process of writing itself is, um, is something that teaches you um, about, um, you know, engaging with the world, not only while you're writing, but also in, in the sharing. And I feel really fortunate that I've been invited to book clubs, to libraries, to um, schools. I just came from an event um, at Quinsigamond with some high school students who are trying to go to uh, college and they, so they have a Saturday school that they've organized for themselves and just wanted to talk to me about, um, you know, some of the things that I've been sharing with you. So um, I, I feel really blessed to have had this opportunity to, to share and learn from people about their experiences with uh, writing, with mental illness, with immigrants, uh, and just with uh, reading good books, which we all like to do, and uh, so I, I'm going to open that up and see if you have any questions, and you know, they could be about anything, not just my, what I've said, but you know, about the book, about me, um, you know, anything you'd like to ask me about or share. Yes? Is this your first book, and do you have any others planned on it? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I actually have written two other books, but they're poetry books. Um, the the one one is a book of poems about the Blue Hills Reservation, which is a, um, for those of you that don't know it in southeastern Mass. It's it's a a, a state uh, reservation with you know ponds and walking trails, etc. But it was the home of the Massachusetts people before the Europeans came and. And, you know, it bumps into the Neponset River, which is where they used to do their fishing. And so, um, so it's a very important area, and the trails that they, uh, that they use to get from the fishing areas to their, um, uh, the sites where they uh, camped out, essentially, um, turned out into our roads. So, for example, Route 138 was one of the Massachusetts native trails. And so, um, so when I moved to Milton, you know, the Blue Hills are in the Milton area, 
I was fascinated with this area and all the names, Chickatauba Road and uh, Unquity Road, it's Quantum. And um, I was just fascinated by these names, so I started looking up in the files of the Blue Hills Reservation because I didn't know where else to look uh, about the history of it. And little by little started piecing it together and these poems started to come to me about um, the Blue Hills and the people who lived there, my imagination of what it must have been like to live there um, as a Native person back in those days. So, uh, so that's one little book, um, and the other is called When Comets Rained, and that's a just a collection of, you know, autobiographical kind of poems about a range of things that um, that uh, I published a few years ago. And then, so this is my first book of fiction, and um, and I do have another book that I'm hoping to to write. Um, this, I think of, try to remember, is a book about love, but it's love in a family. Uh, and so this next book is about romantic love. So we'll see how that goes. Could you talk about your ex family's experience learning English and learning about the American culture? Yes, yes. Um, my. Um, my parents and my uh, siblings had different experiences because I, I came to the United States when I was five. Um, and so if you come to the United States as a kid, you know, kids are like sponges, you learn everything. So my siblings and I all were able to learn English and acculturated more successfully uh, than my father, for example, or, or my mother. My father, um, never really mastered English effectively. He, he, first of all, he had to work. I mean, he was the sole breadwinner for our family of five kids and, uh, what a nice clock. <laughs> uh, five kids, uh, my mom, my dad, and, uh, and so he worked um, in a factory at night for many years. And so he didn't really have an opportunity to do much else but work. And so my mom was able to learn English more successfully, although we, we um, were in Miami for most of my childhood. And so Miami is a, you know, a city where you know, there's so much Spanish spoken that you know, it's a very bilingual city. And um, so it's a little different. So I, I, I think that um, she was more able to bridge that gap, although I think it was harder for them to come as adults and, try to navigate the society then you know kids are always so so resilient yes how old were you when you moved to New England to New England mm -hmm. well um and I have to tell my age <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um just turning 20 uh, <laughs> when uh I came to New England to go to law school at Boston University, so and I came straight from college. I had gone to college at Michigan State. So you went from Miami to Michigan to Boston. Yes. The difference between the South and the North. How did you deal with that? Well, um, in those days, I was very um, appreciative of the change of seasons and the cold. Nowadays, <laughs> I kind of wonder. Um, but you know, thank God we have heat. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I really have liked Boston. I think one of the things that appealed to me as a writer is that it had such a strong literary community. And especially because I, I wrote poetry for so many years, and we had this wonderful little store in Boston called the Grolier Bookstore. And it was all poems, a whole store full of poems. And I thought that was remarkable. I had never seen that before. And uh, I, I felt a lot of um, just uh, connection to the literary traditions in Boston. They, they really uh, appealed to me. And then, of course, you know, I met my current husband when I was in law school in Boston. So, you know, we ended up here together. Yeah. And I have a couple of kids now. Do you have a question? Did you find yourself having to translate for your parents when you were a kid? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I still do. Um, 
this is so funny, you know, my, um, <coughs> it was a combination of that I was um, good in school and the oldest child, that, you know, I was sort of given the role of the translator, but um, I got an email, you know, one of the things I, I can, I'll also pass out cards with my uh, contact information if people are interested in communicating with me, but my, um, on my email, I get all kinds of interesting letters and responses, and I got a letter from this woman. She says, you know, I'm 45 years old. I live in New Jersey. I came to U.S. as a little girl, too, and my parents live a couple of hours away, and they every weekend they save all their mail for me to read <laughs> and explain to them, even now. <laughs> And it's that way, like my mom gets, you know, Social Security Administration sends out every now and then, they send you like different information about some law that changed or some technical change in your benefits. So she, she'll call me up, I'm saving the letter for when you come home. <laughs> so it's, it's a combination of um, not just the language, she can read the words, but also the, um, the fear that she's not going to get it right because she's not educated. So they turn to the, you know, the educated family member to kind of translate what the significance of things are. Yes. As a person with literary interests and obviously um, gifted in that way, what led you to study law? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I had actually gone to college with the desire to be um, a newspaper writer because I had edited my high school newspaper and I was very, I was always interested in writing. But I had a different, I had a very idealistic view of newspapers. I hope there aren't any people here. <laughs> newspaper business, but you know, it, it was, oh, you could change the world by writing exposés and you can make things better just by writing. And when I got to college and started taking a few classes, I realized that, you know, it, it, it wasn't quite that way. Um, and that if I really wanted to change the world, so to speak, or make it better, <coughs> I had to do more than write. And so uh, that is how I became oriented eventually towards law school. In those days, um, I, I, uh, I came into contact with an organization called the National Lawyers Guild, which is um, a, a, an organization that advocates, what is the, the slogan is, uh, that people, people are more important than property. <laughs> and uh, and I, I think I met some, the, some of them on campus in college because they were advocating for Native American rights. Um, this was a time where there was a lot of um, trouble in the Southwest, and I think this is during the, um, the what was the standoff at, in, that they made the movie about with uh, Russell Means? Well, wounded, wounded Knee, knee. yeah. So, so uh, these National Lawyers Guild lawyers had, had been working on this Wounded Knee, and so then that was when I realized, wow, lawyers can advocate for human rights, can make the world a better place. That's, that's a good way, you know, that you can actually make a difference. So I ended up um, on that on that path. I never gave up the writing, though. I I still got my master's in writing while I was a farm worker attorney. <laughs> you know, so I always had both both things going. But I I just didn't feel that I could um, I could do my give back to the community work just as a writer. Although I think some people successfully do. Um, but I like to think of it as both. Both kinds of work are require idealism and uh, uh, an iconoclastic bent because you have to, if, if you want to, if you aspire to something different than what is here, whether in, in fiction or in, in writing, you're imagining it, or a world that you imagine that is more equitable and, and decent, you know, you have to be uh, an idealist. So. You know, I, I feel like the con there's a connection in that way. It's a good question. Is much of your work uh, now in the legal side with illegal immigrants? 
And is it pro bono? Then? Yes. Well, I work in an organization that um, works for low-income people, uh, not not solely immigrants, but all kinds of low-income people. So um, we're paid. Um, it's not exactly pro bono, but it's hard to pay for college on our salaries. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, so, uh, right, so the clients don't pay. But uh, I don't represent individual people. I advocate for systemic reforms. So that means, for example, if um, uh, immigrants are getting denied um, uh, access to licenses for improper reasons, um, legal immigrants, for example, then, um, you know, we try to convince the registry or sue the registry or, you know, the powers that be to try to change the policies. Um, and some of my uh, work is on behalf of undocumented people. Uh, for example, I was involved in a very important lawsuit um, <coughs> that um, would have allowed people who were persecuted in their home country and were trying to get employment authorization while they were trying to get legal status here to, um, to be able to survive. <coughs> and so, you know, so I, I have done systemic work on behalf of undocumented people as well as um, undocumented people. Have you learned any other languages besides English? Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. I, I studied a bit of French in school, and it was a really good thing because my daughter, my 19-year-old um, daughter in Milton, had to study French because they had, that, was, that was the language that was offered in our public schools. They had a French immersion program. And um, so it was very handy that I had learned a bit of French because she couldn't get away with anything with me. But she studied French in um, exclusively. All her subjects were in French from the time she was in first grade until I think in third or fourth. Then they introduced the little English. And now she speaks French beautifully. She's going to college in Quebec and Montreal because her French was so great that she was able to. Uh, to learn it, but um, you know, I love to learn other languages. When I was doing the poems about um, uh, the Massachusetts, I started researching. I thought someday I'm going to learn Algonquin. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a school in Canada that um, has retrieved some of the so-called lost Native American languages, so, so that they can still, you know, be brought back. Which sounds like a Another idealistic thing, but maybe something I could do in my retirement. <laughs> Spare time. My husband says I have to learn golf in my retirement. I go. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring your children up in bilingual in terms of English and Spanish? When they were small, um, when they, once they entered the school system, then they, you know, became English. English dominant children, um, and my then my daughter, as I said, is in the was in the French program. There was no Spanish, so um, she. It's very funny when she speaks Spanish. She she uses the French R, so she sounds like a French person speaking Spanish. It's hysterical. <laughs> a legal resident and a citizen, and when you're talking about the laws that have pushed back against legal residents, yes. does that also apply to people who have become citizens, or if they cross that threshold where they're safe? Right. If once you become a citizen, you can't be deported. Now, there are very limited circumstances in which you can be stripped of your citizenship. For example, there were... Um, some very famous cases of, you know, during World War II, um, uh, people who had been affiliated with the Nazis or were Nazis um, lied on their naturalization applications about their histories and got to be citizens. And so there have been cases they've taken like decades 
that the U.S. government has brought to take away their citizenship and then eventually deport them. But in general, <coughs> once you become a citizen, then your your um, your status is secure. But while you have permanent residence or a, even asylum or refugee, um, you're, in theory you're permitted to live here permanently, but you can be subjected to deportation based on whatever laws Congress adopts to, um, you know, regulate the flow of people in and out of the country. So, in fact, if Congress said not returning a library book is a grounds of deportation, in fact, if it were sustained, you could end up deported even after having had your green card for 30 years. Thankfully, that it hasn't gone to that. <laughs> yes. What happened to the man you, you mentioned, the one who ended up marrying the sweetheart? Yeah, I don't even recall um, because there were there were all kinds of newspapers. This is something I read in the newspaper. There were all sorts of newspaper articles about a variety of cases like that, and they some of them resulted in. Um, uh, there was a Supreme Court case that said that for some immigrants you couldn't apply some of these changes retroactively. You know, you had to apply them only in the future. <laughs> so, so that that affected some people. I don't remember if that person was um, saved by that. In other cases, the the, the statutes were changed. There were some um, interpretations of the statute by the agency that resulted in different changes, um, but, um, you know, there was one, there was another one where I think it was one of the, one of the congressmen who had supported the, who had introduced the bill passed pri a private law, or tried to get a private law just for someone in his district who was caught up in his own legislation <laughs> to exempt them from the law. So different solutions were applied to different people. I don't remember that one in particular. Just the activism for immigration reform. Immigration reform. <laughs> well, I think right now the comprehensive immigration reform uh, proposals seem very far on the horizon, but there is one kind of immigration reform about which I have a great deal of hope. And that is um, something called the DREAM Act, which is a law that would allow um, students who graduated from high schools who were brought here as undocumented kids by their parents and have gone to high school and graduated and have been accepted to college to apply for their green cards. And it's called the DREAM Act because mm -hmm. the students who are advocating for it are dreamers. They all dream of going to college or, you know, some of them joining the military and they want that opportunity very much. They see themselves as members of this society and there's a lot of bipartisan support. You know, uh, there's, I think at last count there were, it was close to, um, uh, you know, a very high number to sustain even a, a filibuster, but it was, it was a very, um, a strong Republican and Democratic group of legislators who have been supporting this legislation and maybe after the election we'll see some progress on that because it's a beautiful, a beautiful law and it represents the best of America. Mm. So are you going to do a reading? Or? Oh no, I was, but I, because I know we have to get out of here, uh, you know, in, before the library closes and they get upset with us for keeping them late. But I, what I wanted to do was, um, if anyone would like to buy a book and have me sign it for you, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, or if you want to take my card, I can, um, I can um, uh, give you my information.